uh, we actually recording it? There we go. It just came up. Ah. Oh. Excellent. Um, so, TS background. Uh, intro. Uh, well, um, basically, all of us were doing like copy in background and BG info and stuff like that. If we, it's hard to remember even a couple of years ago. And so basically what uh, Yuan did with the tool is basically make it, uh, make the test sequence prettier, but also solve some of the longstanding issues we have with uh, especially F8 support. So it was actually there, I think we started a discussion of doing it because with every customer we were at and, and Microsoft did a wrap, uh, wrap risk assessment planning or risk assessment service you always was hit like this is very severe that you have f8 support enabled in your um, boot image and basically it was the only way to troubleshoot in a in a in a good way right uh, so many many had it in production and of course it's horrible so that's why we started the discussion maybe password protecting f8 and do it that and make it pretty. And then everything just started to swell in with ideas of debug mode. And then, then there was a question on adding Dart support for remote control. And then Johan wrote his own remote control solution instead in there. Uh, and now we have a success and failure. Uh, we have domain log on to password protect the F8 support as well. So, so there's a lot of it's actually grown over the years, and that's, I would say that's really thanks to the community. I don't know what you say, Yuan. Yes, definitely. We get a lot of feedback and requests to more or less daily. So uh, thanks to all who has uh, provided that feedback. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's and, your and... tool as much as ours in that perspective. Yeah, and an amazing testing as well. As soon as we publish the new version, there's people try, try it out immediately and we we'll get reports on bugs really, really fast so they can be solved as well. So it's, it's amazing. The community is amazing around these tools. Uh, so how does it look? Sorry, Mark. <laughs> I said you, you solve the bugs by just telling them it's a feature and not a bug. <laughs> Could be. Depends. Depends. Um, so how does it look if you haven't seen it before? Um, basically, we it's everything is of course customizable. You want we'll cover that in a while as well. And and uh, basically we have a bit different UI and we can have progress bar in this side. Let's start the movie instead. We actually pre-recorded it so we didn't have to wait for any unexpected Vim boot issues or something like that. So we'll see if we can post the recording if any of the video as well, if someone wants it uh, somewhere, maybe we can blog it or something. So basically it shows us progress as well. And what I did here is I press F8 and I have my domain authentication to be able to run F8. So we'll solve that RAS checkbox when Microsoft does the risk assessment. We can open command prompt, see him trace. I'm really fast, right? Uh, and we can open the, the task sequence log as well on the machine. Um, so it's actually extremely useful. I use it every day. Open PowerShell task manager, reload and of course we have all the beautiful variables as well um, where we actually filter out some variables that shouldn't be there as well from a um, security perspective as well uh, so that's the short extremely fast demo of what it actually looks like um, and and i think it's i still love it i use it everywhere we use it everywhere and i use the remote control everywhere um, so I don't know if you want to take it from here, Yuan, and, and show how we actually uh, configure it using these tools. Um, the design viewer and the password encryptor and what we use run silent for, which we use in a lot of other tools now as well. Uh, we'll see how much we can cover. Uh, if I can just uh, be allowed to um, share my screen here, then it of will course. be a little bit easier for me. Uh, so let's see. This should be my screen too here. Uh, so... Jorgen hogging it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I released it. I released it. <laughs> so now we should be uh, okay. You can see my screen. I hope two yeah, absolutely. Paused, two paused uh, virtual machines is what you see here, 
Uh, the one on the left, uh, they are very blurry, of course, because they are uh, paused. I will resume them in just a second. But uh, what I would try to do now is explain a little bit how we get from left to right. Uh, if we start by resuming this one, um, th this machine is uh, obviously running a very, very standard task sequence, which was uh, created by running the uh, wizard. And I have done practically no customization at all on it. And uh, it has, of course, the standard built-in F8 support active because we are going to stick a little bit with that. Uh, the one to the right, however, it's uh, fairly more customized and uh, it's running T's background. I haven't gone as far as Jürgen to use uh, AD authentication here. It's also possible to use just a, a simple password. So I'm going to type this here. And as we can see, we have all the possibilities here. We, as, at, uh, like Jürgen showed on the movie, it's also here. And uh, maybe if I'm a little bit uh, careful here, oh, it's taking me a little bit too long. But we can see here where I have my mouse at the moment, it says hidden value. Uh, these two variables here, which ends with the triple zeros, they are hidden. And in fact, if they weren't hidden, you would be able to hear in clear text, read the network access account in clear text, including its password. So we hide those variables. We will also hide the blob containing the uh, task sequence itself, because within that, it's possible to retrieve the domain join account in a similar fashion. So that's a security feature here. And uh, now, I'm and you see if you can zoom in, you and I think people are seeing uh, that they can't see. Uh, that uh, is probably very possible. My idea was doing something like this, <laughs> exactly. and I Thank forgot. You. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have Perfect. the hidden values here, which I have described, but you couldn't see. <laughs> so, now you can pro probably see them as well. It just says hidden value. So, now, how did we get there? Uh, I will minimize this one and I will go to my server here. I could expand this a little bit as well, so we see a little bit more. Now, first of all, of course, you need to download the uh, TS background itself, and that is done from our download page, which is running on GitHub. And on the second tab here, you find TS background. Uh, and we will go ahead and download the zip right away and save it to our download folder. Perfectly, now we have that one and we will open that folder. Now the first uh, you, thing you want to do now is obviously to extract it or rather not. What you want to do now, if you have downloaded this, is to check the properties of this zip file before you extract it and make sure you unblock it uh, we have had some uh, issues with uh, TS background in the past and also quite recently, and it has always turned back and boiled down to that uh, you, you're, uh, you, the user was using blocked files. And that is not a good idea. So always make sure it's unblocked before you extract it. So now we can do that. And there we go. So the content of this download is obviously from the bottom here, we have a manual. I highly recommend reading it. I'm not very good at reading manuals myself, but uh, as one girl once said, if I want to hide anything from you, I put it in a map on the desktop and name the map instructions. Uh, there's also a change log that is uh, frequently updated. We have the application TS background itself. I will move that aside here, or copy it, I did, uh, because we want to see that uh, in parallel with some other th stuff. Uh, we have uh, an example TS. This is a zip file. You shouldn't, uh, re regardless uh, about that, you, should, you shouldn't uh, extract that one. That is for importing in the, uh, in the theme console. So I have done that previously. So in my 
console here, I have an import, imported TS, and that is the one that uh, is stored in this zip file. So don't uh, extract that one. Just press the uh, folder here and import it. Then you will get the, uh, the necessary steps to set up TS background. So the next folder is an interesting one because it holds a couple of tools uh, and the files that you will need during uh, both the setup and also during production later on. Among them is, uh, for example, TS Background Remote Tool. Uh, we'll go ahead and install that now because I don't think I have it. And when you install it, you could um, I put in an AD group here and it should be the full distinguished name. And that AD group obviously will uh, contain all users who are allowed, permitted to, uh, to uh, run the tool and connect to the running clients during OST. So I'm not doing that because I'm using a simple password in this environment. Uh, in here, you will also find a utility called Run Silent, XE, and INI. Uh, this is something we uh, very often use for running pre-start commands in a boot image. Uh, and uh, the reason we use a utility for this, like that, this one, is that uh, you can only run one command in the, the uh, put in one command in the box in uh, the um, uh, boot image configurator, but with this utility, you can stack commands in the ini file. So you can have one command per line here. So on the right, on the left side of this little nice comma here, you just put the utility or executable that you wish to run. And on the right side, you put in all the arguments, switches, etc., for it. So in this case, I'm running a PowerShell script in the same folder that is called prepare disk. If we put these three files in the, and run them as a pre-start command, then we will run the pre prepare disk script, which is useful if you are, have just received a new computer from the manufacturer, which have a raw disk. In that case, this will format it for you, making it possible to download and pre-stage a boot image on that drive. So it's useful for that. And you can also add as many commands as you wish uh, by just, and then just run, run silent AXE. But we'll get, we will get there. Uh, within this folder, there's also design viewer and a, a password encryptor. I should mention that that is one that I have been using because if I, I don't want to put the, the debug password in clear text in somewhere here. So I can just write whatever I want as my password, encrypt it, copy it, and paste it into the config file of this application here, uh, which is going to be included in the boot image. Uh, here's the config file, and in that you can put the debug password encrypted. Or you can use... Uh, uh, an AD group, which it seems like I have here, just a, as an example, and the logon domain. So let's uh, go over to another machine because uh, we're going to look at the design viewer, this one. And I need some tools to show that. Tools that I have, hopefully somewhere around... Um, here, I use I use uh, Run Silent for everything for our in place upgrades for everything because yeah and we have different we actually have a different version of it I realize now as well right you want the other one we have in IPU installer who has some yes. login features as well so yes <laughs> I will I will try to um, well yeah. uh, consolidate that a little bit so we only have one. In fact, we have three because one customer uh, asked for, um, requested a special one yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but it's, it's we amazing. Will, uh, we'll have a look at that. Anyways, uh, this uh, uh, design viewer folder it contains a, a subset of, uh, the, uh, of the TS background folder itself, uh, namely the background folder, backgrounds, and the layout folder. But instead of TS background, it has a design viewer. 
So if we click this one, it will give you the opportunity to design that background that is also seen here at the moment. Uh, uh, it's built up of uh, SAML files. Uh, I will close that so I'm not confusing myself too much. So I'm now in the layout folder. And uh, now let's see if we can uh, show you the trick of the day. Uh, I want a command prompt in here. Ha! Huh. Not everybody knows that. And I didn't until two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to open this uh, folder in the Visual uh, Studio Code by running this command. So now we can see our two, on two separate tabs here, we can uh, see the two files in the folder. Uh, it's a general and it's a status. Uh, I'm not used to seeing it this uh, well formatted, but uh, it looks very good here. Uh, if we uh, yes, start a great out, job. Yeah, yes, <laughs> if we start out <laughs> with the general, uh, the general uh, SAML here, it contains basically everything to the left here and also uh, the title, which is now hidden. I can't or I sh will not uh, close the debug mode, uh, window here. And I, will, uh, I have some reasons for that. So you will have to uh, trust me. Uh, uh, this general uh, uh, grid here, we're working with grids. And if you don't know any SAML, there are multiple videos on YouTube where you can uh, pick up the basics because this is actually very simple. Uh, compared to there many other, of, compared to many there other things. Of, there's some tools as well if you want to learn XAML. There's like XAML Studio and a few other like Windows apps in the store you can yeah. get that'll help you like test various controls. Yes. Uh, nevertheless, when I started this design viewer, it loaded the two files. All XAML files present in this folder will get loaded in, into the viewer. So I have the general grid here. And I have also all the status grids from this file. They are all visible and choosable here. So I can turn them on, off, one by one. This way I can easily customize uh, my background. For example, if I want to change something here on the general tab, and uh, uh, in the general section, then, uh, Let's see if we can do something interesting here. Perhaps we could uh, change the color. Uh, it's light sky blue here. Let's put, make it red. That will be visible. And then I save this, go back here, reload it, and then press this one and we see now it's red. So you can uh, fiddle around with this for as long as you need and uh, as much as you want to uh, make it uh, look like you want. There's also in the root folder here, uh, next to the viewer itself, there are uh, TS variables, uh, uh, some examples of that. So let's say that I know that I am creating my own variable and it's equals to uh, test. Uh, recast, something like that. And I save that one. Now this variable, my var, will be available to use in the SAML file. So instead of showing the built-in SMS TS organization, I decide to show my var, save it all, go back here, reload, and you see. I hope this is clear and uh, we can uh, take some questions later on. But now for the setup itself, which is a completely different thing. Once you're done with these files, of course, and you are happy with them, you must copy them over to nothing less than your TS background folder, uh, which I now uh, managed to get rid of. TS background, here we have it. So this is the real application that we're going to put in the um, 
in the boot image. So just replace those two files with the one that you have customized and you're good to go. You can here, you can also change background. I have only this simple background that you have seen a couple of times already. So that's it. Now, how do we get this into the boot image? Well, first of all, we must put it on a share somewhere. And I happen to have a deployment uh, package content share here. Uh, let's see where I put it, uh, probably here. In this, in this folder, I created a subfolder called boot extra files. This folder I have included in the boot image. Here, so this is my TSB recast boot image, which I made yesterday. And if we check the properties on this one, we will see that under customization here, apart from the run silent that I mentioned earlier, then we have included the boot extra files folder. We have also chosen a custom background here. We can have a look at that because there are some advantages of doing that correctly. So if we head over to that folder for a moment, and this is the, the file that we use as a background, it's just a solid black background. The reason for this is that uh, this will be shown for a few seconds when the when uh, when PA fires up, and if you have uh, some content on it, like your logo or so forth, then when TS background kicks in and start takes over, uh, puts its logo on top of it, it's very very uh, possible that it will make a jump in one or another direction. So it's much better to start out with an absolute clean background without any content on it. It will only be visible for a few seconds anyway, but it's uh, it's good for the aesthetics, so to say. So now let's go back to this folder and the boot extra files. In this uh, folder, I have a part from TS background, which is now, of course, uh, customized with our own uh, SAML files. I have also put prepare disk and run silent exe, including its ini file, ini file, uh, which we will run as a pre start command. So with this method, we will run, uh, we will uh, execute run silent uh, exe, which will prepare the disk in case that is necessary. And on the same time, we will include TS background in the boot image. So it is present there and we can uh, launch it. Now we're coming to something really interesting and that is how do we launch it? Uh, that's why I kept these two guys here running this one and that one. Uh, I will try to enhance this a little bit first. Now if we start notepad, if we start notepad here and then we will browse the disk a little bit until we get to the system 32 folder here, Windows system 32. And we will make this uh, show all files, then we will have some difficulties finding what we're looking for as usual. But uh, down here, there is a configuration file called, this is the one, WinP shell INI. If we open this one, this is the standard default INI file. If we make the same thing over here, which will of course take a few seconds there. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is, yes. Now we can see that this looks slightly different. So the, the, the big question now is how do we change it? Uh, this is uh, something that uh, 
used to be a little bit more difficult than it uh, is today, but uh, we're using something called OSD, OS injection, OSD injection. And I'm going to show you how that is done. Uh, uh, so another thing we could actually have a look at while we're here, that is, uh, well, I think this is better actually because it has more or less a browser in it. Uh, if we go up a couple of steps here to the root, we have an SMS folder here. This folder is added when a configuration manager prepares this uh, boot image. Uh, it's not included in a standard WinP image, but it is in the configuration manager version because configuration manager is adding a lot of files here, including including uh, TS background would have been down here if we, uh, if we were on the other machine. But this, this specifically what we're after is this X64 folder. There's a lot of files in this one, including all utilities used during the deployment. For example, you might have not seen this before, OSD, OSD apply operating system. And there is uh, utilities for downloading content and so on, a lot of them. And it is possible to, uh, well, we can f start out by finding this on, on a disk because on our site server, there is a folder. You have to uh, maneuver, browse to the folder where your configuration manager site is installed. Normally it is uh, on the uh, defo by default, it's under program files, Microsoft configuration manager, etc. I have installed it directly in the root on my D drive. And so it looks a little bit uh, uh, unordinary, so to say. But within this folder, there is uh, another folder called OSD. In here, we have the files. The x64 directory is there, and here are all these files ready to be uh, injected into the boot image when that is built. We can add files here. Uh, we can uh, not add just about any file, but the WinP shell in if INI file, that is possible to just drop in this folder. And the next time you rebuild your boot image, it will use this one instead of the default one. This allows us to, instead of letting uh, 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 nature has its course and start, let's see now, start TS boot shell, which is a built-in, uh, 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 which is a configuration manager utility. Instead, we ask it to start TS background. TS background will then initiate a few things uh, including uh, start taking over the desktop, and then it will in turn launch TS boot shell. So we're interfering a little bit here, and uh, you know, it works pretty well. And it, it is, in my mind, the absolutely fastest and earliest point where we can uh, get control over the desktop during deployment. I am doing one thing here, which is slightly unnecessary in the present setup. And that is that I run WinP in it first. That is not necessary because TS Bootshell will do that work for us if we don't do it ourselves. But there are some coming features in TS background that will require WinP to be initiated before uh, it starts the rest of the um, deployment here. So that's why it's there and it doesn't do any harm. It's just a preparation for future features. So that said, uh, back to the boot image, I guess. Uh, and have a look at the rest of the configuration. So we had a look at this, the boot extra files. We had co have covered the background, which is a better with a solid color than anything fancy because it only shows for a couple of seconds. And we need a couple of optional components here. Uh, we need PowerShell and we need .NET. The easiest way to get these two in here is by simply open this one, scroll all the way down to the bottom and then Take the first occurrence you can find of PowerShell. 
tick that one and it will also automatically add .NET at the same time. So you get two for the price of one if you do that. Yes, just scroll all the way down to the bottom and find the first occurrence of PowerShell and you will get that. We have also here uh, included uh, uh, dot, dot tree services. That is basically Windows uh, wired auto config. That, uh, that is not, uh, not a, th a, th a utility or a service that we need for this, but it's very nice to have because it will automatically add um, uh, everything you need to handle certificates during PA, P, like cert util and other uh, utilities. So it's a nice to have, and it's to a small price, as you can see, it's only a couple of megs. And compared to .NET, that, that's nothing. So we have to do that. Uh, apart from that, nothing fancy here. Make sure it's uh, uh, deployed through Pixie in this case, otherwise you won't have much use for it. And uh, we normally also tick this box because it gives a couple of opportunities to run the deployment directly from a distribution point, which is slightly more effective if you're in a hurry. And uh, specifically in a lab, that is... Uh, the nice to have where deployment takes 15 minutes instead of 30. So that's a little bit on how to set this up. But that's one thing we haven't covered or haven't had a look at yet. So I will make like that. And then we will uh, get rid of this one and open uh, this. It's still running here. That's good. So we can get rid of that and we can close that without any risk. Here we have the TS background remove tool. So let's start that. Uh, here, and here you have a picker. And we can see here that we have one deployment running in my client two. That looks familiar. And uh, we can pick that one. If you're running this for the very first time, you will first have to uh, fill in the name of the site server because it's uh, picking this data from uh, VMI, WMI. So let's pick the client and then put in our secret password, the one that we put in the config file and connect and there we are. So we can uh, start uh, Task Manager, for example, we have that there. Can move it around a little bit, perhaps, yes. It's a little bit laggy. It's no, no high performance remote control, but yet again, we need it for debugging, hopefully not too often. And it's not too bad. So any questions at this point? Or anything yeah. I have missed, Jorgen? Uh, no, I don't think so. I've uh, I've answered a couple of questions, but I saved a couple of questions for you as well, so we can take them on now as well. Um, Q&A just got flooded, in fact, actually. <laughs> <laughs> will, uh, X, uh, will X SMS PH, PKG SMS 1000 TS background always be the path, was one question. I'm not sure I really understood that question. For <laughs> when, when, when you showed where it will actually launch the file and you show where WinP shell file was. Yes. Um, in the, when, when you actually pixie boot to the machine. Yes. Uh, then that was the path. So that was the question. Is it always is it, uh, the same uh, path? Yes, it is. Uh, and uh, the reason also, that's uh, uh, a very, very good reason for using that instead of using any other uh, comparable method. One option would be to inject an unattend file in the uh, in the P, in the boot image and uh, have it launched there from there. But uh, this uh, Win PE shell INI file is the only one that is actually executed on every boot. Uh, for example, if you put in a, a pre-start command, it will only execute on the initial boot on that OSD session whilst this WinP is executed and restarting TS background after each reboot in PE. Um, when, yep, yep. There's a lot of questions I tried to keep up, but I can't. Um, <laughs> um, 
maybe we can uh, what go part? Through, go yeah, through. we will answer all of them later. But we can take another one as well. You you used port four four thousand. Will it always use that, or can we change it? Change it? Uh, you can change that. Uh, this is the default port here, but uh, you can. Well, let's see. I, uh, here, let's uh, expand this a little bit. Uh, if we uh, let's see if I have it here. Yes, I have. Let's open the file location here. Uh, not the one I well, it will do. You can uh, change that here. Remote control port. To just uh, use the port you're uh, most convenient with. Oh my God, I'm, I can't keep up with the questions. Um, but we have some <laughs> things more to show as well. And we have, only have a couple of minutes left. So we will we'll go back to the Q&A in yeah, the end, I think, right? Okay. As planned. So um, I will disconnect this one. You can give it back to me and we'll just briefly talk, uh, give some more examples and talk to talk about uh, IPU installer and servicing really short as well. Yeah. Time flies when you have fun, right? <laughs> um, and that was the correct screen as well, right? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. so uh, this is a community sample as well. We found it on Twitter. There's a lot of other community samples on how you can make it look pretty, as we said before, um, on uh, on Twitter, for example. So check that out as well. Uh, we were thinking about having like, like uh, doing a Twitter poll and ask people to post. Uh, post their different samples so so everyone else can get ideas on what they can do and what they don't want to do perhaps as well um, so that was basically T's background I'm not sure you one will ans try to take some other questions we'll save them to the end otherwise uh, but be before we said we will talk about the new tool as well uh, basically it's actually two you should check them out on the same web page uh, deployment scheduler is basically for scheduling all different kinds of deployments, available apps, uh, required apps, uh, software updates, and so on. But it can also be used for new Windows versions as well. So we can actually post that so we can, um, so you can actually um, deploy a new version of Windows 10 and have a different message and look and feel to it as well. Um, and then we use, the IPU installer, which you have created, which we have a picture up of in here as well, which files it is. Um, basically, it it um, it builds on the same technology as if you run um, a Windows Update box and that media file. You you can do that as well, a standalone. So basically, it's the same idea, right? So we run uh, the, at least two thirds of the updates. Uh, before we actually interfere or interrupt the user in their daily work. And then we actually, then you will only have a really fast reboot afterwards. And that's because we think time is of essence, right? We don't want, want to have as li little downtime as possible. Uh, we can also do post commands as we have here. And then we use the run silent INI again. So basically we have our, we put down a setup config.ini file. And then in that one, we call uh, run silent uh, XE. And in there, we have all the other commands. So here's the example from this example. Brand, rebrand re Windows 10, clean it up, uh, default apps, import, start layout if you like, uh, change apps, uh, uninstall apps, and everything again. Uh, so that's really, um, that's really the idea. And it will look something like this. Again, I've time-lapsed it. So here I get the... A toast that there's a new version available and I want to schedule it as the user, then I will see a new, uh, it actually steals the branding and colors from uh, Software Center, which is, was a brilliant movie. Uh, so we can have text, we can have the user to schedule it themselves. Uh, so I want to schedule it five minutes ahead of time so we can actually uh, make sure that we see it and then I actually fast forward as well, of course. So I save my scheduled uh, Windows 10 upgrade, uh, close it, and then I continue working, right? And then after five minutes, we'll see the time flies. Um, we'll actually get this prompt saying that you can still abort it again if something happened with those since you schedule it. And then we have a new text saying how long it will be interrupted and what it means and so on. Then we'll do the same thing as servicing does 
of Windows 10. Basically do as much as possible in the background while the end user is still working. Um, and then after a while, if we look at the clock down here again, I have very fun with Camtasia. So we, we show a small, small upgrade process, progress, so they don't forget that they're actually doing, it's in the middle of something. And then we actually speed up time a bit. And then finally, uh, around, I won't, don't, can't remember, was it 15 minutes or something? We, we actually get the end user to get a prompt on how we actually um, 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 to restart the machine to finish the installation. Uh, and there it's jumped forward. And then we, when we actually get the prompt, we have the countdown, which is also really fast. <laughs> That's Microsoft minutes. No, it's really not. But still, so we can actually force the reboot and it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So, so, so we can do servicing. We can handle drivers as well. We don't have time to cover it here, though. But we can handle driver update as well. What we can't handle is BIOS upgrades at this point because you need more, more control that we can provide with setup config.ini. And the reason Jordan again is... is basically speed, right? So we did this very, I'm not, should we say that it's very scientific, Ivan? Yes. No, it's really not. We just <laughs> took the same machine and did it, upgraded in a couple of different ways. So basically a clean task sequence took 26 minutes in my face and I couldn't use the machine, right? With the IPU installer, we can cut that down to, it's the same, about the same total time, but we only have a five minute reboot for the end user. And this is going from 1909 to 20H2. Uh, so that's basically the, the plan behind it because we need to, we need to be care, take care of our users and, and try to make them as productive as possible, right? Uh, now I was almost scared that my machine rebooted. That was a bad one, right? Uh, there's other more tools to download as well on Yuan's uh, page um, where we have TS launch, which we showed before at MMS and so on. Uh, Reboot Watcher and our little lock screen watermark as well. So we can display a picture when you actually log on to the machine. Uh, so, it, so you can have them remind users of something. So you can put them on top of the end users, a background picture and so on. So, uh, does, does the automatic restart timer and the Reboot Watcher go as fast as that other timer? Yeah, it can. Just give me Camtasia in a couple of minutes. I will solve it. So we actually had that as one of our plans as well. We'll solve uh, all the servicing problems by using Camtasia and speed up time in all, in all demos. So now it, it, it's basically it handles reboot, but that can also be done with deployment schedule as well. So be so sure to check them out um, over there as well. Uh, and you got the link before as well. So it's the same link. Um, and we will absolutely um, answer all questions as well. Um, what anything? Oh yeah, right. Uh, had a... Now let me quick. Uh, we have a little, a little quick shill here for uh, recast hosting this. Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen here and show you something yeah. fun. Uh, all That's right. I share. Da, 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 da. So um, we have a little something for everyone who's attending the Community Tools webinar series. Uh, you can actually go to this URL here at the top. I'll put it in chat as well and get a free seven-day trial of Right Click Tools Enterprise. Just got to fill out the form. I'll get you your license. Um, you get that. Uh, if you have any other questions, by all means, let us know either in Q&A or um, you know, shoot us an email like support at recastsoftware.com. Uh, but I'm not going to eat up too much of your time because let's, let's get back to the awesome content you all came for. <laughs> That was extremely fast. You talked faster than I do. Uh, so should we try I to try. take some of the questions in there as well? Um, uh, that's still left, right? Yeah, we got a few here still. There's one on someone who's using uh, the IPU installer for 20H2, and after a successful upgrade, their users are seeing two versions of edge and losing edge save passwords uh do you guys have any ideas on this one i haven't seen that actually could it be that it's losing side by side or something interesting before in the old uh, edge before the upgrade perhaps but i haven't seen that actually i've seen other weird stuff with 20 h2 upgrades and edge versions or downgrades yeah. actually exactly <laughs> downgrades yeah. actually um so absolutely uh, but i haven't seen that one though no? 
Uh, I have Interesting. a one. There was a uh, question here. Oh, I might have missed it. Someone was asking to see your your Twitter handles again. Oh but yeah, I've I've actually I responded to that. to that one as okay. well. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, there was a comment as well. Ledge edge. Legacy Edge password don't transfer to New Edge. No, and we shouldn't. If you look at all the baselines and recommendations, we should actually not save passwords at all in Edge because it's extremely unsecure, as the same goes for Chrome. Right? So and I, th I don't know if they fix it with Firefox, but Firefox has the same issue, uh, which is why we generally want to use like, some more secure third-party uh, password storage. Yeah. Although everyone's railing against, uh, is it LastPass everyone's freaking out against right now on Twitter because <laughs> they made some change that nobody likes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, okay, so check out the latest ISO from volume licensing. Seems there was an issue with one of the medias exactly with the Edge one. So that's good. So then that's why, because we haven't run that media from uh, VLSC, we haven't seen it then. We only update the known one. So, um, uh, what was there more questions? Um, uh, I, oh, um, uh, are there a community site where we can ask you guys more questions? Um, I don't know. Try to do Twitter. I think that's best uh, right now. We don't we don't have any comments on your site, right, Johan? Nope. Uh, no, not yet. But we will transfer that download page to our uh, company uh, site, and uh, there will be a lot of more possibilities then, because this is a very very simple download page set up on, uh, on GitHub pages, so yep. uh, it will get more advanced as uh, time goes by here. You can always comment on one of the posts on my blog and we'll pick it up from there as well. Uh, yeah. Because both me and you and get emails every time someone writes something there. So absolutely. Yeah, it's, hard, it's hard to miss. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, can 1709 be upgraded to 20H2? I'm sh yes, it can. Has it been widely tested by Microsoft? No, <laughs> it hasn't. Um, but we are absolutely doing it, unfortunately. We could add that as well. Um, uh, it's a lot of uh, the edge stuff. What do we more have? Can the download, can that download update the update directly from Microsoft to the client computer, we did need to create an update package with an updated ISO in. That's actually a good question, which will lead to a long answer. <laughs> um, if you talk about the IPU installer, right? Um, because it actually worked, you one, but it doesn't work anymore, right? Right. <laughs> we, we did have a plan for that. Uh, actually, we could download all the patches in advance or uh, harvest them from uh, a machine that we updated using um, the Windows Update box and uh, then uh, inject them during the installation. Uh, we could do that. It worked perfectly well on 1909. It started to go slightly worse on 2004, and it completely blew up in our faces on uh, the latest version here, 20H2. So, uh, no, we can't do that exactly, but uh, there are some options when it comes to media here. Uh, what we have published is, is a version with which you configure a media folder with a complete content. If you skip that media folder and instead put only the EST file and the Windows Update box in the, directly in the root of the, uh, uh, the application, the content folder, then it will also work, but it will download all content directly from Microsoft during installation, uh, uh, during the upgrade. But it is certainly an option you could use, for example, if, you, uh, if you're targeting uh, compu computers uh, outside of your local uh, intranet and you're uh, uh, allowing split tunneling, then it will work and it could uh, pull all the updates uh, straight from Microsoft. So we will document that and add to the uh, concept. It already works, but it's not been documented.
I'm typing answers. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can see sure. that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, Questions are coming in faster than they can be answered. <laughs> Um, let's see. The upgrade you did was from 1909 to 20H2, which your tool only took 15 minutes during the reboot and only one reboot. I, I can't remember if there was actually two reboots. I think that depends a bit on if you allow uh, uh, if you allow dynamic updates, for example, as well to come down. But I can't remember if I saw one or two in that one. I actually how how I did all those. Um, scientific comparisons. I actually started upgrade, started Camtasia, and went for lunch. And then I watched the recording afterwards and check how long it took. So, uh, so I guess I can watch the full recording and see how it actually went. But uh, it, the reboot itself took only a couple of minutes. Um, absolutely. I think it took like five minutes reboot, not 15. So it should be only five. Of course, depending on what you do, if you add more, I only had, I had like five post commands in there. They will take time as well. So, but absolutely. Uh, would you recommend a servicing option for in-place upgrade or better use task sequence? Um, <laughs> this is a long, uh, I think there are sessions about this as well. Uh, keeping it short with the new update strategy, for example, if you go from 20H2 to uh, 21H1, if you haven't tried that, it takes one minute because Microsoft has already preloaded all the content for you on your machine, so you only switch it on. So, so going forward from 2004 and forward, I would say servicing all the way. Um, and start managing drivers and BIOS updates um, uh, proactively instead, because we, we, uh, if if you look at, there was an I talked to a customer today with the, about an HP. Yeah, they had an issue with uh, a blue screen after the January update, uh, the optional one. I guess many of you have seen the same thing. Again, the solution is upgrade BIOS. Yeah, so, so so we need to start upgrade BIOS and drivers more often than we do servicing. Uh, so I would say going forward with the new world of things. And, and again, look at the Internet Explorer. Uh, disable Internet Explorer standalone. You know, you can disable. So if a user try to launch, um, um, if you try to launch um, Internet Explorer and type an URL, you will get blocked. That change actually was introduced not in a version of Windows 10. It was introduced in the January cumulative update for all supported versions of Windows 10. So I, will, I, would, I would say move to a model where you update BIOS and drivers uh, separately and keep uh, servicing separately going forward. That was the short answer. <sighs> uh, maybe I should have started with that one instead. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a question regarding if you have a blog on updating drivers on machines already deployed using configuration manager. I, uh, I do have, but it's really old. I don't. I'm. I'm sure not much have happened since. But basically, uh, it's uh, hiding it using uh, use uh, use whatever tool you use to front the user, like. Um, a PS app deployment toolkit, and then trigger maybe if you if you. If you take out and use subtask sequences for each model or each vendor or something, and then read, do the driver task sequence again using PSAP deployment toolkit and inform them of reboots and everything, that would be one way to do it and be able to reuse it as well. So, uh, absolutely. We also have uh, another one of the webinar series coming up is going to feature uh, uh, Nikolai and Maurice, uh, who oh, yeah. specialize a lot in driver yeah. and BIOS management. So I would highly yeah. suggest checking that webinar out. Yeah, they have a great uh, solution out there for it as well. So uh, absolutely yeah. check that out as well. Um, that was that's chat and the Q&A at the same time is just <laughs> overwhelming. <Yeah. laughs> it's interesting. You don't know where to start. Um, absolutely. Everyone loves what you have. <laughs> um, 
I generally try to focus on Q and A. It's a little easier to, to look through it all. Um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll help manage this for you guys, and you can just answer the questions. Don't have to worry about looking back and forth. I think I'm supposed to be doing it anyways. Uh, someone ha currently has uh, one sequence to one task sequence for multiple use cases. Uh, it's done using uh, front end input from a technician using a UDI designer. Uh, and this person wants to add the troubleshooting that TS background gives. Does it allow for any front end input on top of that? Well, TS background will always place itself uh, in the set position in the Windows array. So you can run anything on top of it. So it basically it replaces, uh, close to replaces the desktop itself. So you could definitely do that. Perfect. Uh, we have another question. Can you trigger the native restart from CM with dialogue and countdown following client settings? Is this talking about? Uh, instead uh, of instead of initiating our own uh, reboot, you uh, want to schedule a native reboot from the CM client with the same dialogue as the end user recognizes, I assume. Uh, and we but we um, we don't do that now. Maybe we can. Maybe we can. Uh, does the IPO install a check for hard blocks? No, we don't. Um, it actually we need we need to do that before or something. And and again, hard blocks. I think this is this is for the uh, servicing uh, discussion. But moving that workload and using servicing instead, everything of all that is basically history because that's handled by Microsoft and as soon as the hard block is gone then you will get the upgrade so um, but using dynamic updates is a good start on getting less uh, getting a much higher um, um, success rate as it will update dynamically drivers and whatever it can to solve the uh, potential block for you as well um, absolutely <laughs> There's so many more questions even regarding that edge issue still. Um, there was one person who's actually this is more of a, not a question, but a comment where they're just noting that uh, if you're experiencing the issue with the, the duplicate edges, uh, it's it's due to 20H2, including an old version of edge. And if you run an MSI yeah. repair, it, it fixes the issue apparently. Oh, I have a, we have a colleague or a, a colleague in the trade who actually wrote a blog post on how to repair it using a PowerShell script. So. I will see if I can find that link and uh, post it there. Yeah. Useful. Um, let's see, if we have multiple departments and not all use TS background, can we use a one-off for the TS background exe instead of editing the OSD folder on the site server? This might be a Johan question, that was but a... Uh, I think he's busy typing. Uh... Where, where, where did you find that in the chat or? It's in uh, Q&A at the, well, uh, okay. the top for me. I don't know if the order is differently. Oh, OK. <laughs> Multiple sites, multiple departments. Let's see now. OK. That's a tricky one. I'm not quite sure that I really get it. Yeah. I, if, if I'm understanding correctly, they're trying to use TS background for some yeah. departments, not others. And maybe they're under the mistaken impression that uh, just by dropping this on the site server automatically overwrites. And when in fact, there's there's a little more, oh, because you, you dropped that file on there. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. You have to remove that file uh, once your uh, TS background image is updated in case you're using uh, uh, if, if you have more than one boot image that you will have to maintain, then you will, of course, have to remove the file while you, when, you're when you're updating uh, other boot images. So it's only present in the folder for the few minutes when the, the TS background boot image is updated. Otherwise, it shouldn't be there. I should have mentioned that much more. Sorry. That's good clarification. So just yeah. use different boot images. Yes. Perfect. Uh, we already answered that question. 
Please include the Q&A in the recording. I'm curious. I'm not sure. So I know all this stuff's on YouTube live. I don't, uh, and anything we answer live will definitely be there. I'm not sure if it automatically includes the rest or not, but we'll, uh, I'll talk with our marketing people to, to see if what we can do on that one. Um, more questions on drivers. Uh, regarding the drivers, vendors usually don't vet the drivers for the latest OS builds until a certain amount of time has passed. Uh, do you have uh, better suggestions for better handling this issue? I think still, still we should we should remember that we are in a corporate network and take it slow because there's always uh, what did you call it before, Mark? Features in new versions of Windows 10 as well, <laughs> so that we don't want to put our end users through anyway. So I still, even if we if any if 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 we look at Windows 10 servicing and it's going to be really easy to do servicing, only one minute reboot took. I think the enablement package is 26 kilobytes uh, for going to uh, 21H2 because everything is already in there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you should do it day one anyway, perhaps. Uh, maybe we should still wait and, and make sure that everything around us works. Uh, VPN clients, uh, yeah, we never know what will potentially break, right? And, and that's basically what off. we are seeing as well. We're seeing that Upgrading things now, upgrading Windows, the things that break is some is really like infrastructure close, like VPN clients and the third party antivirus. Yeah, the classics, uh, basically. Yes. Uh, the, the end user applications or the company applications actually do work really well. So many times it's a it's now nowadays servicing is more for AIT to check that the infrastructure component works and maybe less uh, do some more risk assessment on the other part so absolutely yeah heavy testing this would be a bad time for uh, your vpn client to break <laughs> yeah oh, we've guessing done, most your <laughs> we had had many customers during the pandemic who actually switched vpn uh, uh, vendors and so on during the time so it's as long as we have a cmg we're fine right we can solve everything so we, everyone needs a CMG, that's for sure. Cloud management gateway forever, that solves everything. Even if you do always on VPN, uh, direct access, anything. If you have that still, you still have a back, back way into the machine if it doesn't connect to uh, the VPN always on or whatever it is. So absolutely. Next version be released. Um, which tool is that in reference to? I guess you could answer it for all of them. <laughs> yeah, we'll, what we're, yeah, what Yuan is working on mainly now is uh, deployment schedule on IPU install. I don't think we've done anything with uh, TS background in a while, so we'll see. There was another good question. Is Mark Godfrey related to Jack Black? Maybe I should ask that instead. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. Uh... <laughs> Um, I'm gonna go with I hope not. I'm actually not a big fan of his. <laughs> That's a good one. He's um, got a few good movies, but he's, he kind of annoys me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so okay, so we got the language question as well. Um, <laughs> me and uh, fellow MVP Ronnie Peterson did a servicing. I've done it a couple of times now, servicing it. Um, there's a couple of different ways of solving the multiple language packs. Um, 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 yes, servicing is possible, but it, you need to use the media of the default language instead of an English media to do the upgrade. So it will be potentially more packages if you don't want to do the switch. We have done everything from injecting 20 language packages in Windows to adding them afterwards. And, and language packs is really boring as well. Um, but there's a solution for that as well. If you, if we look at the modern managed desktop and you install the language pack from the store, then it will actually retain that language pack after, after a servicing. They, it will actually upgrade automatically and finish that for us. So there are things coming uh, for us. So uh, absolutely. And I agree with the chat. We definitely need remote control over CMG. Um, that's, um, that's coming soon. Isn't that coming in? I thought I remember... Uh... DJM are saying something about that's going to be in, maybe be in tech preview soon. I know they're working on it. A, it is in. Working. It's been in tech preview for I don't know okay. two years um, or something. Oh, okay. uh, but it was, and um, 
but it wasn't uh, i think they answered that one in um, some chat and and um, it was not tested enough before the last release of configuration manager so basically it's as i see it it's up to all the tap um, customers now to actually test it and say that it works for the rest of us um, if it's in the tap but someone wrote in the chat that it's in the tap program so hopefully as long as they test it and approve it then it should be fine so i'll probably be here in a few weeks hopefully then <laughs> yep assuming it goes well of course <laughs> yeah exactly um uh, for companies, <laughs> so, wow, uh, where should we start? Should we start from the bot? Oh, I didn't see all of them either. Um, where do you get your Microsoft news from, Jorgen? Uh, that's a good question. Twitter, I like Twitter. Um, um, and uh, I get a lot of other things from other channels as well. But I should, I would say mainly, mainly Twitter, actually. Uh, I like Twitter. You get a little extra probably through the um, MVP channels, I assume, as well. Yeah, and there's also some other great uh, programs as well, like uh, customer connection programs for these different pro products and so on, where where you can always influence and get more information as well. So so there's there's tons of possibilities. Uh, so check if you're interested in those ones. Check with your uh, Microsoft uh, representative or contact, and they will hopefully be able to uh, spot you in there maybe as well. Um, for companies with limited bandwidth, what's your recommendation for IPU servicing? That's a hard question. Is it limited for each client or internally or externally? Um, 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 it can be tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, and things need to come down to the machine, so it's hard to... Um, see uh, from the for the future going on it's definitely a servicing yeah um, without a doubt but right now it's uh, servicing will always give you now we started talking services again if you don't put <laughs> down a setup dot setup config dot ini file that turns off um um, dynamic updates. Dynamic updates will always run in servicing. As you can see that if you run the tech preview of Configuration Manager, you have a new option to use a, a servicing package for doing a task sequence in place upgrades. And as soon as you check that box, all the options below, like use dynamic, everything is grayed out because it can't be controlled anymore. And if you look what it actually does, it actually pulls a lot of data from the um, from the from Microsoft in the dynamic updates. So I would say, but then again, if you don't do dynamic updates, you still need that update to come down afterwards. So that's a it's a, it's a tough question. But I would I would use a solution where you can pre-stage as much as you can and maybe not use dynamic updates depending on your uh, the environment. So it's a hard question to ask without more information. But something like that, absolutely. Someone's asking about documentation for setting up CMG, and I'm sure Microsoft's got their own documentation. I'm also going to mention, uh, so if you know Gary Block, which I'm assuming you do if you're if you're in this webinar because you're doing um, OSD. Of uh, course, he we actually do. did a whole yeah, he did a whole blog series. Or he does a lot of blogging for Recast, and it's, uh, it's like a part time job. And he did a whole series on setting up a CMG as part of his uh, setting up your lab kind of thing. And there are numerous posts about it. So I'm actually going to put a link in chat. And if you go to there and search for CMG, he's got uh, numerous blogs for each step of the process. Otherwise, there are so many others out there. It's crazy. Yeah, there is the only, the only tricky part is to keeping them up to date. Um, I realized that my first blog post is from like 2011 and all the uh, there isn't a link that's still alive in that one, so that's um, <laughs> that's the bad part. Um, I'm thinking of doing a Twitter poll if I should dump all those old posts instead of trying to fix them. So, um, but absolutely. You linked your you linked your blog on here, didn't you? I'm not sure if I did. Sure. We we CCM looked and we had it up there. Yeah, we had it up uh, there before, so. I'll put another link in here because it's got. That's a content. good. Uh, that's a good uh, for for everyone that's thinking about blogging. If you write 
one blog post, you can count on getting a lot of comments over over the years. Um, so I actually have some comments that actually corrupted the database and stuff like that because they're like hundreds of them for the same blog post and stuff like that. So yeah. Wow. Uh, so there's a lot of, and that's a, that's a hard one as well, trying to keep up and answer all the comments. Uh, but we try. And so, the name of the x64 folder on the configuration manager server and the name of the INI file you have uh, edit to start the TS background. I think we better uh, redirect that to the manual because yeah. it's, uh, the yeah. information is all yeah, in there. Yeah, and it's easier with the picture as well. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Someone was uh, talking about the path to the. Uh, it looks like Johan's uh, answering this uh, yep. by typing yep. it. We are. This reminded me of something earlier. There was somebody was talking about, or he was talking about trying to find the folder. If you're not sure where your configuration manager installer folder is, there's actually a default share created of it that makes it really easy to find. It's just, you know, slash slash your server slash, uh, was it SMS underscore site code? Yeah. And, yeah. and that should go straight to it if you're not sure where your, uh, where your root folder for the install is. Yeah. Question for SCCM client health. What's your best suggestion on remediating broken clients? That's a tough question. It happens. I think it's first of all, you have to find them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, there's Anders Rödland has a script for it, and there's other community tools as well. But I think he's the he's there's some checks that maybe not really updated, but it's it's really good to, to use to get the more feel from it than the Microsoft view in the console. Uh, the tricky part with remediating broken clients is always finding them and then fixing them. But I think my, my general feeling is that the SCCM client is much more healthy and stable until something breaks because then it breaks on more machine at the same time, basically. Uh, so, so looking over time, I don't see a huge, uh, I, I only see a small number at customers until something happens in the environment that, that changes things and breaks it. So. Uh, so I think it's maybe a little bit um, uh, less problem than before, but still it's a, one of the most tricky things. And I mean, everything we do is, everything we do in Configuration Manager is more or less security related today, right? With patches, if you have a machine with broken client, you don't get patches and that's a security risk. So, uh, and client health has always been the biggest problem and all that part is the biggest problem in everything we do. That's the first thing I, I ask for, uh, same for if we look at desktop analytics, uh, where's the gap? I have this number in desktop analytics and, and now we've got a really good view on why machines are re aren't reporting, but that's the problem. How do we actually know that all machines are reporting? That's one of the biggest biggest problem we have in there but um, it's been it's become better and someone put the link in there as well for uh, Anders Rödland's uh, uh, configuration manager client health script and it's it's great we use it a lot actually uh, it's really great I actually just I just linked a YouTube video in there. It goes to the uh, NW Skug uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Anders, along with uh, Ken, Kim, there were a whole yeah. bunch of uh, yeah, there there are a whole bunch of little um, things they presented at the recent NW Skug last week. And among them uh, is Anders walked through the whole setup for his whole solution, um, and it's uh, it's pretty robust as well. So if if you're curious of how to how it works and all that, then then that YouTube video will sh will show the whole shebang for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, how about PFE client health remediation? Absolutely, but I don't think it's available to everyone. You need a, you need to have them in place and have that solution in place. Otherwise, that basically builds on the same technology. So absolutely. I was just wrong as you have a solution to solve it. So yeah. There was something I read on Twitter about that the other day that someone didn't like a component of the PFE one. I don't. I'm trying to recall what it was. Um, I wish Gary was here because I think it was Mike uh, Mike Terrell commenting about Brian Mason not liking something it adds to the database. Um, it's the custom uh, DDRs. Yes, yeah. that's what it was. So it adds a bunch of custom DDRs and those are irreversible. So if you ever say, well, we don't want to use that solution anymore, 
that's, that's, still left. that's that's a choice you can yeah. make. You don't get to ch make the choice of uh, reverting your database. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> I was that's listening. A, that's a downside. Yeah, that's good. You haven't fallen asleep. That's good. <laughs> but I think we actually covered all the questions, right? <laughs> we made it through them all. About <laughs> 70 questions in Q&A, not to mention all of them in chat. So that was, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if we missed something in the chat because it's just flying by sometimes. So yeah. it's really, really hard to keep up. So if you asked the question there and didn't get an answer, put it in Q&A. We'll answer it for you. So we can give you a couple of minutes before wrapping up, I guess. Lots of thank yous. I want to add to that too. I, uh, I'm just moderating this and I love hearing all of these. <laughs> oh, and just one more reminder. Uh, I know I mentioned it before, but uh, yeah, check out that link for the free trial. It's uh, seven days free of right click tools enterprise. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize what all's in there, but it's, it's there's a ridiculous amount of tools in there these days. Um, and you know, free is free. So <laughs> check it out. Yeah, I, I actually go back and check it out again with the trial when we are at new customers because there's been stuff added since I tested it last time as well. So it's good to, to keep an, um, yeah keep updated to see what happens. Actually. We have numerous full-time developers. I mean, um, when what, three years ago, it was like one person. And then now we've got like Chris, myself, Brian, who's also on here. Um, we have hired three new web devs in the last year. We um, then we just acquired Handsoft as well. So uh, it's it's getting updated monthly with major updates every quarter. All kinds of new new features being added there. Oh, someone's asking about the DDR stuff in the database. That was the PFE client health tool. So if, yep. if that's something you don't like, then that's that's the one downside to it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of we couldn't really function without the right click tools. Now I I talked to uh, talked to a colleague in the trade as he he told me as well as the first thing he does when it comes to a new customer if they don't have right click tools in place he installs them. Uh, I didn't hear that. But it's for your the... community. It's it's good to be helpful. Yeah. Oh, Q and A. Uh, what are some good post scripts to run after upgrade? Um, from I guess assume it's we're talking Windows. I oof, basically everything we get. You should know what crazy suggestions we get. But basically, clean up, add back customizations. Um, uh, maybe fix. Uh, I I did that last time. I added a fix for up for repairing the newer version of Edge. So I actually had that after the upgrade as well. Um, so there's a no, numerous things we can put in there. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. remove apps yeah. again if you have new apps you want to put in there and so on. I, but they I, should I be still, put, I still, sorry. Yeah, they should be put in in addition to the cleanup PowerShell yeah. script that's already included because that is basically cleaning up after the IPU installer itself. Exactly. So if you need to do more, run more scripts, just add them to their run silent INI file. Just the way uh, we can run uh, the pre-start commands. I'm working on a blog post on that, but I haven't. Um, yeah, it's in the to-do list somewhere in the middle. So <laughs> um, I can't promise anything soon, though. No. Um, uh, we got a request for remote uh, control over uh, internet, CMG. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you will find a cleanup PowerShell script in the download as well. So it's, I don't think we can share the file here. So it's better to grab the download and grab it from there. Yes. Uh, what's the best way to update Microsoft Office 365 monthly enterprise? That's, um, is, are we talking newly deployed machines or are we talking on existing machines? Um, I think there's scripts to actually update the package sources. You actually always... Uh, uh, install the latest version. Otherwise, that should be fairly easy to do. Um, for keeping machines out there up to date, that definitely depends. I would say that that switched over the, during the pandemic as well from moving from being patched with Configuration Manager to being pulled from internet in many, many cases instead. 
so we actually benefit for that instead. Um, so that's a, it's a, it's a hard question without knowing all the facts. Um, Oh, you did come in chat. He's talking about existing machines. Uh, he was talking. Yeah, I saw that as well. Yeah, that's uh, as I said. That's okay. that's a pandemic. It's been moved a lot to Microsoft directly. <laughs> but but then again, if you don't use split tunneling, then that's no gain. Um, but otherwise, I think that's that's one of the workload that's being moved fairly fast to uh, to. Um, uh, to uh, Intune and co-manage. Otherwise, use CMG, always CMG. CMG is the answer to everything. Peace on Earth, CMG. Um, everything, <laughs> CMG. No, but see, everyone should have one because I, I think we set it up for us. I don't know how many customers, just because they use always on VPN, but in that rare case where that VPN doesn't work, then they still can help the customer. And if we look at now when we get remote control over CMG as well, that will be amazing. Just another tool in the toolbox to fix things. So yeah, we should absolutely have one. Uh, we should have a CMG session instead. CMG and servicing session should be, sounds like that's <laughs> the next one coming up. Right? Uh, can anyone and share real world more. costs of a CMG? I don't think it's, um, um, I think it's peanuts. Um, I think even Alvin Mark wrote the post on some examples. Uh, I have mine running and it's, it's like, I don't know, could it be um, $120 a month or something with only a couple of clients? And the clients really don't add up that much cost. Um, um, because it's so little data anyway. So, of course, it depends on what you do. But traffic, data traffic is really cheap now as well. So. I'm uh, and, uh, grabbing Johan Arumark's post to put, put it in chat, by the yeah, way. perfect. No, you beat me. I was going to say the other Johan. <laughs> yeah. There's a post on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there it is. Oh, I sent the wrong... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, you have an ex you have an example in there as well. We put everything on the CMG, and it's about two thousand dollars a month for one hundred and sixty five thousand clients. Um, and I think that cost is yeah exactly yeah. So it's fairly fairly uh, small, I would say. Uh, uh, do you require split tunneling to have a CMG? No, you don't. But it's it could still be a point to actually download all content from a CMG anyway, depending on your boundaries and how your network's set up and all that part. But it, you definitely benefit more of having a, a CMG when you use split tunneling, because then you can make sure that that traffic doesn't uh, um, kill the VPN tunnel. Um, yeah. We've had that discussion in many cases as well, where we have customers saying that uh, our, our network guys, they will... Uh, they will block the DPs next time we have a we have Patch Tuesday if we don't solve the traffic issue we had. So, uh, so so that's basically it's a network discussion. So we need to buy them donuts and bribes to get some help on solving these issues as always. Uh, so we actually can get the real one as well. Uh, OSD over CMG, could it replace standard OSD needs? Well, it, it could for small sites, absolutely. We still have the Pixie. We have the boot issue if we don't want to boot somewhere. Um, there's community solutions to that as well. But otherwise, that's basically the biggest one that we need to boot from something. Um, otherwise, it could be an option for smaller sites, absolutely, uh, without a doubt. Again, if you use, depending on network, if you have like internet breakout in the um, US for the whole world, then it probably doesn't make sense at all. So uh, network is important as well. Um, yeah, exactly. In my previous work, there was a question as well. In my previous work, they don't allow CMG because they want everything running inside a VPN tunnel. Yeah, we there's those uh, scenarios as well where you have uh, 
reasons for doing that. Um, in what I, my experience from the pandemic for the last year is that nine out of 10 of those scenarios has changed because of the pure load on the VPN tunnel and, and, and all that discussion with people working from home and everything. So, but we still see it, absolutely. Even for modern managed clients, uh, we still have customers that want all traffic uh, going through their tunnel, absolutely. They had some concern about safety in here. And if, if you're worried about security of CMG, that's something I certainly wouldn't uh, worry about. It uses multiple uh, security features to make sure that, you know, it, it's it's safe and not going to be a risk but for you. The, the yeah. pushback, I've, and I got that myself when I try to implement internet-based client management, which is not the same thing, and yet it's related. You know, it's that, you know, my security team wanted to do deep packet inspection. Yeah. But they wouldn't let me encrypt. I'm like, no, it's encrypted end to end. Yeah, but we need to decrypt it so we can do a deep packet inspection, then re encrypt it so you don't know. I'm like, that's that's called a man in the middle attack. This is what we're trying not yeah. to do. I thought. I thought I was I, I was secure. thinking we were trying not to do this. Like, no, 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 but we have to because we need our gear to do deep packet inspection to know what you're doing in that encrypted channel. You just gotta Yep, that's what I did. I there's just a lot of there's a lot of Microsoft. My head. Yeah, but there's a lot of Microsoft services that doesn't support uh, exactly that for exactly that reason, actually. But they pay well. millions of dollars to have this piece of thing that does this stuff. So you can't tell yeah. me we can't inspect your traffic. That's <laughs> yeah, it's a facepalm moment. But a lot of security teams I've worked with, some of them are great, some of them uh, actively make my environment less secure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the questions are coming. Be uh, benefit of using enhanced HTTP versus HTTPS for CMG. Enhanced HTTP requires all machines to be Azure Domain Join. Yeah, that's actually a benefit, exactly. So we actually get that done, right? Um, although I don't... I mean, we are in... We are talking... Yeah, I... Uh, HTTPS is actually not that big deal to implement these days. Uh, many of us have a, a PKI infrastructure in place. So I think HTTPS should be uh, more used than it is. Um, and if you look at the latest tech preview, you, um, if you haven't enabled HTTPS or uh, enhanced HTTP, you couldn't actually install it. And, uh, um, at all. <laughs> that was a hard requirement. And if you look at the deprecated features in Configuration Manager, HTTP is deprecated. So uh, that will be removed from the product within 18 months, I think, or something. So Microsoft will, uh, for, I, I assume if we look at the technical preview upgrade, if you don't use these features, they will uh, they will warn you or they will they will do something when you upgrade to, to make sure that you know that it's been um, deprecated and that you should move to HTTP or enhanced HTTP, HTTPS or enhanced HTTP. There was a, another question, Q&A, about uh, your PS1 that form. Oh, I'm you know, sorry, you're typing a response. Uh, you <laughs> you're always typing, yeah. Yeah. My, my base concern Very there is if, if, it's booting, <laughs> if it's booting the legacy, I'd hope it would fail automatically until you Next. switch to UEFI. <laughs> yeah, I just checked the script. We're checking the um, uh, the TS variable, if it's a UEFI or a legacy. And uh, depending on that, we're formatting it differently. Someone actually thought that you were wearing a hoodie, Brian. <laughs> and not the onesie, so. This is this is head to toe. <laughs> they even got the socks on today. <laughs> Amazing. <sighs> What's Jorgen like to... drinking in his glass? Well, I wish it would be beer, but it's only <laughs> um, um, product placement. So actually, but it would be better if it was beer, though. That's for sure. That was a fancy multicolored can. It was some variation of Pepsi. It looks like. Yeah, it's. Actually, in, it's Pepsi Lime. Oh, in Swedish. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, so interesting. maybe it looks different here. It's so long since I've been to the US, so I can't remember how everything looks. 
Uh, it's actually, I think it's today. Oh, I think it's still a couple of weeks. Otherwise, it's 13 months and I did an air, airplane ride to a customer or um, basically a customer visit. I think I have one customer visit during those 13 months. Otherwise, it's been strictly remote. So. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, and as someone, Nathan, wrote, there's still some... Uh, systems that actually require x86 and uh, stuff uh, running on the machines we um, for we we feel you that's the only thing i can say <laughs> we we yeah. we see that as well uh, way too often uh, oh. and with the new ltsc statement with only five years support that will be a shift as well uh, so uh, we'll see i know about Fortune 100 company that's running LTSC on their regular workstations, and yeah. I just face palm. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, that I think I think that was is isn't that the trust issue? I mean, I think I think now we've seen that servicing actually do work, and so I think that from the beginning was a trust issue. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, a trust issue and the fact that. They didn't earn that trust. Servicing really I, was yeah, not good. Yeah. I didn't say <laughs> I mean, that. There's a reason people tried I said it. it was a trust issue, not why it yeah. was a trust issue. <laughs> and, 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 you know, think too, what like they were, because we pushed back, but, you know, uh, li like I'm sure many customers, we had, we had Windows, like, sorry, Windows, we had like Microsoft representatives come to us. We were a sizable organization and they're like, you know, here, trying to get us on board, right? And we're just like, listen, guys. There's just no way we can move that fast out of the gate. Maybe someday we'll get there, but like, I, I don't care how good you say it is. I don't think we're going to on day one, be moving as fast as you, you are. And through three days, you know, you know, two, three years later, what, what ended up happening? We're not moving that fast. Right. That's when they extended, extended the support of the fall release. The support <laughs> allowed, you, you know, you can skip a thing. So we're basically where, you know, we kind of said, this is how we think it would work. You need to make it work good and you need to give us some longer time to get there. And maybe years down the road, we'll, we'll feel fine. We'll just, we'll just YOLO it and just say, you know, release the servicing and we just trust it's going to work. But, you know, you can't, you can't transition that fast. No, oh, and I think, I think that the technology was, I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at the commercial pre-release blog post and they actually test out going to 21H1, um, I mean, if if we've had that, I mean, if, if to be honest, you, you change more in Windows 10 when you do install a cumulative, up, cum, cumulative update than when you install 21H1, right? Because it only mm -hmm. enables features that's already dormant on the machine. But it changes the Windows version, and that could still be an issue. But we should have moved past that by now. Uh, so if we've had that for a couple of years ago when we started that discussion, and it only took like one minute to reboot the machine and be in a new version, then it would be a different ballgame. The problem was, as you said, it was like, yeah, you need, to, you need to distribute six gigs to all the machines at least. Well, Plus and, 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 and we might wipe out all your customizations, so, yeah. right? So, yeah, exactly. You know, like in all the things you did, and again, we can. That's a separate discussion, and you guys, yeah, have absolutely. Those discussions. Yeah, should absolutely. you do those things, right? How much should you customize, right? That's just, yeah. but people did it, and so it's like, yep. hey, I did this stuff, and then you wiped it all yep. gone, and you yeah, know, once bitten, twice shy. Yeah, exactly. But I think still, I think ever. Every time I unbox an autopilot machine and runs it up without removing apps, I still think that should be there should be a bigger difference between pro and enterprise because that's that stuff shouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah. it was, and I'm told. Uh, I mean, I'm told it was a heck of an argument to get it out of enterprise. Yeah, right. That that was that that did not go down lightly. No. So. Um, oh. There's one more question here. Oh, I think this is related to my comment. Uh, what's the issue with running LTSC on regular production workstations? I mean, you can do it because people do, but uh, one, it's it's not designed for that use. It's designed for uh, machines that need to be a little more static, like uh, maybe like factory floor machines or, or kiosks or digital signage or things you aren't touching a lot. Uh, and by by 
leaving on that, you're kind of limiting your users. Uh, like you get all these new security features in every new version, you, you're not getting those. Uh, new productivity features, you're not getting those. Uh, it's kind of the, the easy way out of not uh, you know doing your Windows servicing. Um, but I mean, everyone has to make the decision for themselves, but um, I don't think it's the preferred way personally. <laughs> I think the thing that kills it off as well was when Microsoft said that Office 365 and 365 apps yeah. isn't supported to run and will be blocked to run as well. Uh, and that basically, that's the nail in the coffin. <laughs> yeah. yep. Stole the words right out of my mouth. It's like, yep, that was that was a damn, you know, because yeah. I was too. Early on when we were doing those first attempts, it was like, oh man, I'm spending so much time trying to make this look like LTSB, what you know, and and then I read, you know, it was like, ah, I see. Well, okay, that's dead then. <laughs> Moving on to same, you know, like just moving on to same semi annual channel. Yep. There's another uh, question regarding uh, naming system. Uh, you mean I, the, I the, the format background? Oh, yeah. Okay. No, it doesn't. So you need a front end of uh, some yeah. kind for that. Like UI plus plus or something yeah. like that to yeah. solve that. Your example, your example image there was uh, from uh, Minnesota IT Services. They're the uh, state agency that runs IT for the state of Minnesota, and you actually saw in the, in the image there that they're using UI plus plus in their example because um, yeah. it said something about installing apps from UI plus plus. Well, I think we're, uh, oh, never mind. Every time I think we're going to wrap up, we have more questions. Uh, speaking of that, does the silent run actually allow for UI app? Yes, it does. Uh, I suppose it would have to for UI++ plus plus to run. Yeah. Yep. So that's no problem. All uh, right. So it's finally looks cool. like we've answered everything and everything yeah. else as well. <laughs> that is impressive. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. We love questions, though. Nothing against those. I'm so glad we no, have. We, there are 86 answered in, in Q&A and uh, countless dozens in chat. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, we should probably wrap up then. Let's give one big last thank you and round of applause for uh, our Swedish friends, Jorgen and Johan. Always Thanks, a pleasure. Um, you guys are one of the greatest in the community, and we all, uh, always appreciate all your contributions to the community. Uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you both in Miami at the latest. If I hope so, if, too. If uh, yes. <laughs> uh, we really miss meeting everyone and having all those great discussions, and because that's how we get better, all of us, right? By think hearing how other ones are doing as well. So that's great. And thank uh, you very much for hosting this excellent webinar. Uh, it's always good to see you. You too. I actually still have a, a Vikings hat that I bought for you to give to somebody. <laughs> oh, so yeah. It's been sitting in my, oh, yeah. been sitting oh, my yeah. truck for like three years now. But oh, yeah. uh, so we'll, <laughs> anyway. I will, I, will, I will remind you before Miami. <laughs> good luck getting that after <laughs> yeah. on carry on. Yeah. <laughs> just oh, wear it's it. not a hat with like the horns. It's, it's just, it's like a, yeah, it's not that kind of hat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Thanks again. Uh, have Thank a good you, day, everyone. everyone. Thanks for joining, <laughs> Thank everyone. You. Have a great day. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye bye.